can I ask, what is one of your, what is your favourite aspect of, of your job and working at the AAT? It's so very quiet at night and during the day often because we're a long way from anywhere. We're on top of a mountain. It's nice and cool, so I really hate heat waves, but living up here is great because it's always nice and cool. You get some very surprising weather. Um, getting that weather at three o'clock in the morning when you hope to be observing is, is a bit, bit of a downer, yeah. but it's exciting because it can just sort of happen. We have a thing called orographic cloud here, which is cloud that just forms out of nowhere as the wind blows past one of the nearby mountains. Oh. And so we can be observing, seeing perfect sky, and then suddenly everything gets really foggy and we have to close the dome because otherwise we get the mirror fogging up or something like that and it wouldn't work so well. So they're the things I like about. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I guess because you are in an optical observatory, the weather can really play havoc yes. on the outcomes of, of, you know, what's coming out of the telescope. So I imagine you're quite, a, quite an expert at, at weather as well. You, you grow expertise by observation, yes. Um, we have certain rules, like um, we can't observe when it's raining because the water would get on all the equipment. Uh, we can't observe if it's too windy because then things move around too much. Uh, we can't observe if it's really humid and the mirror temperature is too low because it will just condense onto the mirror. And that happened to me once a few weeks ago. I wasn't paying attention and I'd opened the dome and we were getting some really good photographs of stars and then suddenly from our displays all the stars vanished and we couldn't figure out what had gone wrong and so I had to look around for all the problems and in the end I'd failed to watch one number which was the dew point temperature of the air inside the dome and it got just a little too high and at that point the mirror just fogged up like a mirror in your bathroom mm. and then it just scatters the light it doesn't reflect the light straight and so it doesn't work anymore mm. and it took a whole day to defog that yeah but even the the process of of figuring out what is happening yes. right it really exemplifies the the problem solving skills that you need to have in an environment like yes. this and a job like this oh that's really cool so we've spoken a lot about the technology here that uh, you use and you take advantage of at the AAT could you comment a bit on the beautiful technology we're seeing behind us it's very dated, which I'm a big fan of. We don't often <laughs> see things like this. I, I kind of feel like I'm in NASA a bit. Could you tell us a bit about the origin of this technology and the things you have to do to keep it running? Well, as an example, the, the switches, I don't think we can get these switches anymore. I think these are from the period of the Cold War after World War II. Um, and they're the sort of switches that were used in big power stations and military equipment. Um, and some of the components are not easily available. And so when we have to change a system, we might have to stop using one of the switches and start using computer controls instead. So these computer controls were a change to the system which happened, say, 20 years ago. And so it doesn't look like a phone app. You know, yeah. it, it, it's not designed for touchscreen. It's not actually a touchscreen. It's just mouse and keyboard, the old technology. We do have some things that we can use on phones for doing some of the work we do. Um, and we will eventually move more towards that as that technology is um, what's available now. Mm -hmm. But another example is we have some dials over there which can show the position of the telescope. And they're called synchros. There are an electrical way of referencing rotation of a piece of equipment and I don't think we can get them anymore like they're, they're very rare um, but if we're going if we go looking in other people's junk piles then we find them in military submarines ships um, all sorts of places like that um, so it's it's what was built to last back then and some of these switches have lasted for, you know, 30 to 40 to 50 years without any servicing at all. Whereas getting a modern piece of equipment to work for that length of time is problematic. Yep, very difficult. <laughs> Are there any other interesting or unusual 
places, you've kind of ended up with the skill sets that you've learnt from working here? Yes, yes. Um, well, not from working here. It was more sort of I, I built these skills uh, when I worked for computer companies many years ago, doing fault finding and problem resolution, and also engineering of new systems. And about 2009 or so, a project started up to bring computers to children uh, for learning, education, primarily elementary students across the world and I joined that project as a quality assurance engineer and worked my way up to chief technology officer. Okay. So um, that's one of the things that's sort of part time for me now is I still keep that project a little bit alive. Sure. Uh, we made three million little laptops in China and they're all in the hands of children. Um, they're probably all mostly, the laptops have all mostly been thrown out by now but that was certainly an enjoyable use of my skills. Yeah, no, that's incredible. I know from my own experience growing up, I did not have a laptop, I did not have a computer, and I spent many, many mornings and afternoons in the library uh, trying to work on my assignments and yes. all those kinds of things. So that something like that is really life-changing, uh, you know, for people who don't have access to that type of technology. So, yeah, thank you for, for your work in that space.